Alright, so now that we know the electrolytics are bad, it's time to pull the knobs and the chassis, bare minimum. We're going to have to replace the electrolytic capacitors in there. I think there's only, I think, four bolts that hold the, oh, come on. I didn't think that was held in by a set screw. It's not. It's just, there it is. Just stuck in there real good. And let's see what is held, what's hold this in place. Yep, there's some bolts and then the speaker comes disconnected. We have two electrolytics up here and one there. So let's replace those and see if we get any life out of it. In typical Philco fashion, none of their electrolytics are marked with the actual value. I take that back, actually this one is. No matter, I looked up the schematic, and they're 8, 8, and 10 microfarads, so I'll just place all three of these with three 10 microfarad electrolytics. I'm going to flip it over, but I think I'm going to remove this shutter. What do they call these guys? They're weird. They uh, This is a shadow meter. It's what they are. They're the precursor to the electronic version, which is the, uh, notice the eye tube using a phosphor, and... Uh, vacuum tube with a emitter this is a mechanical device i'm not sh quite sure how they work but when they work they're kind of crazy looking um, that allow me to get better access to the underneath of this thing because turning it on its side is going to hurt my neck well this is curious someone's been here and in here before me and they've done some work They've replaced all the electrolytics in here. Let me just see if, make sure they didn't leave them in circuit. Some people do that. We've got one left in circuit here. That's kind of weird. Let's see, where does that go? It goes to that cap. And where does this guy go? It goes to field coil speaker. So what are these guys doing? So this, where does that go to? That goes to the rectifier, and then where's this guy go? Freaking weird. Unless there was another electrolytic in the circuit that was a dry electrolytic. Oh, looky here. This one is still in circuit, too. Hmm. And... One of these has got to be ground, I assume. Let me see. Let me flip it over. I want to see if this guy has got a sleeve. Uh, I'm take my glasses off so I can read this. What does it say? 312. I lost my flashlight recently and now I can't see anything. Let me. What in the hell does that say? That cannot be a 3 and a 1 and a 2 microfarad cap. I need to look at the schematic again. This is ridiculous. Okay, it's as weird as I thought it was. It's literally 3, 2, 1 microfarads rated at 250 volts for this. <laughs> so someone kind of has halfway been in here, done not much. Looks like all they did is they replaced one of the electrolytics. There's four still left in here, so those all need to be replaced. I'm going to dig in my supplies. If I don't have any three and two and one microfarad caps, I'm assuming it's not super critical. I'm going to have to go with five or ten microfarad caps. All right, so I've replaced all the electrolytics. Going to take it over and see if it works. i got to say, this is a really clean chassis. It's been kept somewhere kind of nice and clean and dry its whole life. There's no corrosion, 
not really any dust money. There's not even really any that much discoloration in the wire. Usually red wire by this age just looks like brown. This thing has what I hate more than anything. This is why I hate working on Philco's. It's got these things called Philco Bakelite blocks. And what they are is Philco thought they'd be real cute and prepackaged components into little boxes. So each one of these little things here with the little clips on it have as much as one, two, and three components each. That way they could just bolt these in. And I guess it saved manufacturing time. This guy That doesn't look good. You've got tar boiling out of there. That means the caps are probably hosed inside. These others look okay. They're all going to have to be replaced. And the way that you you tell which cap is which is uh, looking on the side. Here's just a number that's embossed. And you have to look it up on the Philco forum to find out. Okay, it's back in his cabinet. Since I've already farted it up and nothing blew up, I'm just going to go ahead and go for broke and try it out. See if anything blows up dramatically in here. Got tubes glowing away. Two, because with him, these 52 players at Jimmy Garoppolo, and so the roster that they have, I just can't. And if you'd like to be part of the discussion this evening, just call this number, 888-367-5353. Well, able to support us. The Bay Area Rescue Mission has been caring for the homeless and impoverished, providing food, shelter, and a fresh start. Yeah, I got some issues. I mean, granted, all I've done is replace the electrolytics, but I hear a hum. It's probably attributable to leaky caps. Number two, the volume pot seems to have zero or very little controllability. It could just be dirty, or the volume pot is bad. Uh, the tuning mechanism is really stiff and hard to turn. The controls are dirty. And I'm kind of wondering about that cap that was melted underneath. That can't be a good thing. Let me take a look under there. All right. I was able to uh, solve the volume problem, luckily, and the buzzing problem that was one of the Philco blocks, the one I indicated that was burnt. It was in sorry condition, so I replaced that one. So we're in good shape as far as the set kind of working. I want to work on the cabinet a little bit. It's getting towards the end of my day. Like I said, I've been busting my ass on electronics lately, and so I feel like now it's time to relax a little bit. It's getting towards the end of the evening. We know that unless I mess up now, the project should be a success, which means I should be get it done well in time for this weekend. And now it's time to work on the cabinet a little bit. I think someone did redid the black trim, but I think the rest of the finish is it's original. It's in really good shape if that's original, but we got a few scratches and abrasions. I also need to fill in these cracks with where it was broken off and re repaired. And what I'm going to do is go over it with my favorite product of all time, if I can just get it open one-handed. As the knob rolls down to the street. Anyway, it's old English. It's a furniture product. It's been around for a million billion years. Probably in good housekeeping or whatever. And you just sprinkle it on there and you get some old paper towels and you want to rub it in there. Okay, so this is now watch this is what's so magic about this stuff. See these scratches? Ooh, they disappeared. See so see what this does is it fills in all the dry areas of the finish that have been exposed to UV and all kinds of other stuff and you'd be amazed what you can do as far as bringing back an original finish and I know there's a lot of people out there that for some reason 
their number one inclination when they see something like this is, oh, I need to refinish it. It's got an old finish on it. Well, yeah, it does. And when you strip that old finish off, it's never going to be the same again. I mean, I kind of wish someone hadn't done this with the paint, but, you know, at least it was done well. It is what it is, but I think the rest of the original finish should clean up nicely. All right, so this is after several applications of Old English. I'm going to let it sit on there wet. I want it absolutely to sink in all of the dry, open areas that could possibly cause a discoloration. And then I'll wipe off the excess maybe in an hour or so. This, this finish was pretty dry. Anyway, I'm going to go back to the electronics because there's a lot of work ahead and I'd just rather knock this out as soon as I can. All right, so we're well away here. Um, I've replaced all the paper caps except for the ones that are, of course, in the Bakelite blocks. And I know this one's the across the line cap. I'm familiar with that one. I didn't need to look up that code. That's replaced. And what I do on these guys is I get a little bitty drill bit like this. And you see these guys have these little rivets like right, right around there. Well, if you get the right drill bit, you can just drill through the rivets and it disconnects everything inside. Some people, for some reason, like to stuff these, and if that's your thing, that's totally fine. You have to take all the leads off, unbolt it, then get the tar really hot and dig it out of there, and then you can connect the stuff from the inside. I just choose to do it on the outside. That way, if someone in the future comes along, they'll be like, well, clearly those Bakelite, clock, those Bakelite blocks have been replaced. But I don't want to get too far of myself. I want to make sure it still works. So sometimes I actually wire the Bakelite blocks wrong, and since I've done a second, the first one worked fine. I'm going to test the set again to make sure we're still firing on all cylinders because that would suck if we weren't. All right, it's working even better. Smart life. The gift card also. Overdoses. It would have been a lot last year. It would have been a lot, lot more if not for Narcan, which is an easily administered uh, inhaling drug that uh, cleans your system. It's getting better and better. That's what happens. You incrementally replace parts. Don't lose your space or your place rather, and. Continue checking every once in a while to make sure you haven't goofed because it'd be kind of crappy, almost said the S word, to get to the end of your project and realize you messed up somewhere 20 steps back. Okay, I want to demonstrate how easy this is. So you see these little rivets on this bake light block. Let's try and get a close up of this. See, it just goes right through the rivet. completely disengages the wire inside. That one was kind of crunchy. There we go. All right. Then you just want to brush off the crumbs. Sometimes I run another wire, jam it down in there, like a paper clip or something, just to make sure everything's clear. In fact, I'll do that right now. Of course, I happen to have a paper clip right here and not bent in the right way. Sorry for the bad video. But just want to wiggle it around and in there and make sure everything's disconnected. If you don't do this, sometimes you'll plug them in and it'll get a little bit of a crackling spark as the last little bits of the foil like crackle away. <clears throat> I looked this one up. This is a, what does it say on the side? 80-8035 and I looked it up and it's two 120 puff equivalent capacitors and um, I was digging around through my supplies and luckily I just so happened to find some of these old ceramic guys and so how this works is that one lead of one capacitor goes here one lead of the second goes here and they both tie in together right here and it's interesting these both go into one of the RF cans, so it must have something to do with trim or reception, whatever. I'm not explaining it in very engineering type terms, but whatever. All right, welcome back to day two, working on the Philco. I've had a little bit of a hiccup here, which is that somehow I wound up breaking it. It was working great, and then all of a sudden, as soon as I started replacing Bakelite blocks, I figured I was in the clear because there are three in here that are just one section 
capacitors, 0 0.05 rated caps, and the centers are only as a there's there's nothing there was nothing attached here. So this one and this one and this one are rated just 0 0.05 microfarad caps, and they use pins mounting lugs number one and three. There's two distinctive types here. There's one that has one side of the cap going to chassis ground, as is, as in this one, because we have this lug that also is attached to this bolt that goes to chassis, and then we have this one, which is not. And I double-checked everything. What I did is I went online to the Philco bench, or whatever they call it, and I traced all of my bake light blocks here and drew little diagrams about how they're supposed to be connected and they're all right that's the only other thing I've replaced since it quit working and so the only other thing I can think of is somehow maybe maybe a tube has somehow in the intermediary term gone bad that's not unusual. That can happen. I, I took the speaker out because I got tired of having to... Well, actually, you know what? I just realized one other thing. There's a cap that is still in there. An old cap going to one of the IF cans. I doubt that that's what the problem is. I, I'll just get back to that maybe later. But in the meantime, I'm going to cook up the speaker and see if my tube sockets are good and solidified in place. We also have this tone control cap that shouldn't really have anything to do with it. We have audio. I'm getting a hum, but I'm just getting no radio reception whatsoever. Well, welcome to the third day. Actually, it's morning, and um, I just wanted to indicate what happened, because yesterday I spent, well, last evening I spent a good bit amount of time trying to figure out what was going on with this thing. I was getting no radio reception at all. In fact, um, when I was tested both pins number two and three on both the 78s and the 6A7, I was only getting about 30 volts, which is way, 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 way low. And uh, I was chatting with my friend Rajesh, who was so kind to uh, kind of give me another eye on this thing. And there were a few things. Uh, one issue was that this guy, which is supposed to be 32K, was measuring close to 80K. So I temporarily clipped in this 30K resistor, and that brought the voltage up a little bit more on the screen voltages for these pins, but still not enough. It was like 60 volts. There was also a total loss of B plus on this capacitor. So something was pulling it all down, and... I went over the schematic and my work over and over and over and over again, and I could not find anything I'd done wrong. And it still wouldn't work, and so I was about to give in. I was about to throw in the towel. And uh, long story short, sometimes you can make a mistake that is truly humbling. And I'm not sure which one of these Bakelite blocks it was, but one of these guys, I had failed to drill out the old capacitor all the way. And so I think what had happened is that when I drilled one of these out, the whatever aluminum stuffing that was inside uh, got stuck between one of the active leads and ground, and that was pulling down the voltage and subsequently killing part of my B+. And so when I stuck, when I got my drill out and like redrilled all these guys just for the hell of it, I don't, I, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was like, well, whatever. The set came to life, and so now it's working really well. I'll need to replace this guy with that resistor, and then I may actually unbolt these bakelite blocks and clean the crap out of them because I don't want any potential future shorts from happening. And then it's going to be time to install a safety fuse. I do need to replace the one or two caps that are in the tone control, because tone control is not really working, because the caps are dried out, obviously, and not doing their tone control duties. 
and then we will install an audio input and uh, then we will continue working on the cabinet there's some things I want to do there's some loose pieces but we're in much better shape but basically I spent all of last evening diagnosing a very hard to find obscure problem and that just happens I think sometimes it is um, good to have that happen every once in a while it kind of puts you back in your place and makes you realize you can do this for your entire lifetime and you will occasionally run into a problem that is your problem that you caused that is completely unforeseen but I feel better had a good night's sleep and uh, when I get done with work today it'll be time to get back to this and I hope to have it completed either by tonight or tomorrow we have to have this whole console completed and done tested and ready by Sunday which is Four days from now, plenty of time. Okay, so it is now after work. And what I did is I came out here and decided to remove all the tar that was inside these caps. Because I figured there's a possibility that some of that foil that was drilled out could cause another short. So I painstakingly removed and dug all the tar out and it makes a huge mess. But luckily the set still works just fine. <laughs> There's a few things I need to do that are kind of important. Number one is the wires going to this plug are bare going into this. The problem is, is that they are... This whole plug is stamped together. Well, it's basically it's held together with rivets. So I need to find a way to insulate this. Probably what I'm gonna do is get some electrical tape and make sure everything is completely insulated. That's just asking for trouble when you got B plus on that. The other thing I need to do is replace the capacitors that are inside of here. This is the tone control block, and let's see. Is that marked on here? It'd be good to find out what that tone control is. I'll have to look it up, but it's crucial because if I put the wrong values in there, then I'm not going to get the right tone that it's supposed to be. All right, so I've rebuilt the tone control. I dug out all of the old caps. They were buried in tar. And I put the new ones in, and each the caps are basically united via a common connection. And then each there's a value. There's a point zero zero three, a point oh one, and I believe a point oh two. I can't remember the values at this point, but anyway, each one of those values goes to one of these connections, and this resistor goes here, and that will affect your tonal ranges. It's pretty basic. Again, I wish they didn't put stuff in boxes like that with tar because I had to dig it out. I'm going to fill this up with glue and reinstall it, and then I'm going to fix the speaker connections. And then it's going to be time to add a fuse, audio input. Uh, let's see what time is it. It's already like almost five. This thing is a huge time suck. I remember when I was asked to do this, like, a, oh, no, it's a Philco. I know it'll take a lot of time, but, you know, every once in a while you need to be brought down on a level. These are definitely challenging sets, especially for the uninitiated. And uh, so, you know, I appreciate a good challenge every once in a while. Okay, so I've installed the audio input feature. This is going through an isolation transformer. That'll actually help boost our audio just a little bit. And we have one side going to ground chassis, the other side going to the top of the volume pot. And then we have a set of resistors under there. I'm just about out of resistors. I need to get more. You tie the right and left channels together, so you get true mono. And that goes out and over, and it's connected to our Bluetooth. We disconnect the Bluetooth. Uh, basically, the radio is automatically going to be shunted when you plug the audio in, and automatically return as soon as you unplug the audio device, so it's automatic. All right, so let's try it out. See how it goes. Of course, the loud washing machines going like mad out there. I've got 
just a little bit of rattle going on in there. I'm not concerned about it yet because oftentimes what happens when you put these back in the cabinet, you're going to get some resistance from the grill fabric and whatever wooden structures are in front of it. And that can often negate that that borderline coil rubbing sound. It's I think it's just like there's just a smidgen off and I don't want to mess with this yet. There are ways to recenter the cone, but that can be really tricky, so I don't advise it unless you really know what you're doing, unlike me. All right, well, I decided to take a look at the cabinet, and I noticed that the top still felt kind of funny. I've got some hardware missing. So all the screws that are holding this front panel on are missing. And there's some pretty big gaps where the glue should have been, so I'm going to do some uh, reattaching of pieces, regluing of some pieces. I just want to overall enhance the structural integrity of it. Okay, so I've reclamped and re-glued a bunch of stuff in here. That's now drying. We've got screws in that. The bottom of this got ripped off years ago, and one of our members added this wooden brace. I added some L brackets to make it even more structurally sound. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if I could paint that brown just to disguise a little bit more? And I looked around my garage, and there wasn't any there. So, luckily, neighbors are throwing away a bunch of garbage. We threw away brown paint. So, I'll take anything for free. I just hope it's still brown. Of course, I'm doing this one-handed with my screwdriver. All right, this is not going to work. Apparently, that has not been opened in a very long time. The lid is rusted on. Anyway, I think it's fine. It's brownish. Probably looks brown when it's painted on. All right, welcome to what might be the last day of the restoration process. This morning I went over to the museum and got a fuse and some fuse holders. I want to install that before the power transformer. That way if there is something catastrophic that's gonna happen, that fuse will blow first. Just got to keep in mind, the set's around 90 years old, and that means all of the insulation that's wrapped up inside that transformer is also 90 years old and you shouldn't really trust it to hold up forever and so if something goes haywire in there instead of this blowing up or you know causing a lot of smoke the fuse is going to blow first now the second thing i'm going to do is i think i'm pretty sure this had a, a bottom cover on it right now when i put this in the cabinet the underside of that chassis is exposed. Now granted it'd be pretty hard with this up against the wall for someone to reach around and try to stick their hands up underneath it. But people being people, who knows, maybe someone has a dog and it somehow gets back there and licks the electronics or something. So I found this piece of pegboard. I'm going to cut this and I've got some uh, pieces of wood here. I think I can add these as a shim for this to rest on, this, this piece of wood. I'm going to screw it underneath here and rest it there. It's This is a little bit lower than this, so I'm going to add a little piece of wood here. And actually, I mean, I'm going to put it right there is what I meant. And so I'll need to see how that's going to work out. But first I'm going to install the fuse, then I'm going to install the wood, and then I'm going to work on the cabinet a little bit more before I do a final reassembly. I want this thing to look good. Uh, we've got a few little spots here and there I want to touch up with a permanent marker, maybe some black paint. And then maybe go over it with some car polish to get that, that nice final shine out of it. And then I think we will possibly call this one done. This has definitely been a little bit more of a challenging experience, but I think we need those every once in a while to kind of bring us back into reality. Alright, so we've got the uh, safety shield installed. That's good and solidly installed here um, it's actually wider than the chassis there's no way that anyone could slip their fingers in all the way through there and reach up I mean I guess if you really 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 tried maybe but I doubt it but anyway better than it came from the factory and I've also installed the safety fuse this fuse is going between one end of the incoming AC line and the other is going to the the main of the power transformer. So this is your your little bit of 
added safety so that you're not going to fry anything. And you add that to the proper across the line caps. This set is made safer than it was from the factory. And so now I think it's time to start working on the cabinet. The last part of this puzzle, we want to get that cabinet all squared away. I'm probably going to get some glue and uh, secure this and that. And then we'll move on to the cabinet and then it'll be time to do some reassemblage. All right, so it is now time to start waxing away on the, uh, the cabinet. I've been having a hard time figuring out if this is the original finish or not. It, it kind of looks original because you've got a lot of raised areas in the grain here. Either that or someone just did a really good job of covering the old finish. I can't tell, but I know this has been redone. That doesn't bother me. In fact, the finish, if it is redone, looks better than most, so I'll take it. But I am going to buff it up. Uh, these came from the factory Shiny, not Satin. A lot of people assume old radios are supposed to look like that. Some of them were satin, don't get me wrong, but a lot of them were glossy. And just after 90 years, uh, they get abraded, they lose that gloss. It's like a car. If you didn't wax your car for 90 years, or if, if somehow if you had a 90-year-old car that survived <laughs> and you never waxed it, what would it look like? Assuming it sat inside its entire life. Anyway, I'm getting too carried away. I use this orbital buffer and liquid wax. I use a, a traditional Caranuba car wax, which is this stuff here. Uh, it's Meguiar's old fashioned cleaner wax. Now, if you live in another country and maybe you don't get this because it's an American product, just look for something that has it's Caranuba. I don't like using any synthetic stuff either. And I liberally apply it to that, the pad and the radio, and just go to town. Don't get too carried away. Do not put that. Do not crank it. Uh, take it easy at first. Go slow. Uh, if there's any problems with the finish, you'll want to find out. I don't think there is on this one, so I'm not as concerned. So here we go. All right. So this is after oh first application. Just gonna see what kind of difference that makes. I do think at least the top is original. I know it's not really picking up on the camera. I spent the last minute talking to myself, thinking I was filming. What I was meant to show you was me removing the first layer of wax. Well, I did, and you can see the top already is a lot shinier. And also looking at this more detail, I do think is it is an original finish. At least the wood parts, I'm pretty sure that is not. I seriously doubt that is original. It looks too perfect. And plus, you can see some chips that are coming through where he didn't sand it down all the way. That's fine. It's I think it's still going to look good. That doesn't bother me one bit because I wouldn't have bothered to do that at all. I would have left it the way it was. But um, you can see there's still quite a bit of a, a crazing and abrasive like action going on here. We want to remove that. Now I may come out with some uh, plastic polish. I use Novus Number no. 2 for heavily scratched areas. That'll quickly and gently remove a lot of the deep scratches and you'll get closer to getting a glossy finish quicker. I know, it's supposed to take time, but sometimes uh, there's smarter ways of doing it without busting your ass like I used to with a rag. Okay, so I've got pretty much all the waxing I'm gonna get done on it. It's actually looking pretty good. Uh, there's just a few little nicks in it. Well, I thought at first maybe I'd get some paint out and touch it up, but I think I'm just gonna touch some of these areas up with this little permanent marker. It's hardly noticeable. So some of these little areas that we got some little bit of paint loss, I don't think that's the end of the world. It's good. Little dibs and dabs there. Little nick up here. Uh, there's a few little nicks here. I know some of the furniture guys are probably rolling their eyes right now, like, don't do that, that's a terrible thing. But we're just putting on some final touches. Oh, there's a little one down here. I got that. There's a little scratch here. And one here. And there's one here. I'm not too concerned about the sides. No one's gonna see that. Do need to fill these in. Well, 
missed one right here. Sometimes you just gotta stand back, see if anything else is glaring at you. It's looking pretty good. Probably give it one some more when I put the camera down, but we're looking a lot better now. Absolutely whales. I'm really glad the uh, the weird rattle in the speaker. I kind of figured the cloth would help remediate that, and that's what exactly what it did. There's no rattles. Good clean audio. Now I would not crank this thing to the hilt. I mean, but for being a 90 year old radio, it does sound pretty damn good. All right, guys. I know this was kind of a weird, challenging episode, and thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, just a little bit of a note, I'm actually going to be changing jobs, and there may be a couple of weeks where I'm, you know, too tied up with getting ready for the new job, and also, I'm not sure what my computer situation is going to be, so I'm filming a bunch of episodes now, so if you see this episode, just know, hopefully there'll be a few more in between the gap. Thanks so much for watching, and see you guys next time. Adios. Classy, classy, something just gathered.